Well, welcome to Carrying on the Needlework Traditions of the Volga German Women. This is being brought to you by the Intermountain Chapter of the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia. A little bit about myself. My name is Debbie Hearn, and I am a Volga German descendant. My great-grandparents immigrated from the village of Husenbach in 1912, along with four of their children. They originally went to McCook, Nebraska, and subsequently, five years afterward, to Brush, Colorado, where they remain the rest of their life. And I hope that you will enjoy this presentation today. You'll see several different examples of needlework that Volga German women have done and also uh, their descendants. Contributions by the following members of the Intermountain Chapter of the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia and their generosity has made this possible. We have Sherry Melling Stone, who will be doing the bed turning and has also provided information. We have Annette Adams who will be assisting with the bed turning. Myself, I'll be narrating and I've contributed quite a few quilts. Um, we have Dave Hurt who is our videographer and his mother, Dee Hurt, who will be his assistant. Those who graciously shared their family heirlooms for this production are Sharon White, contributor of quilts, pillowcases, doilies, and crochet baby items. Evelyn Wilhelm Redfield, contributor of the feed sack quilt and feed sack information and hand embroidered pillowcases. Vicki Strong, maker of some tatting. Myself, quilts and a quilted jacket. And Nancy Castro Gregory, who also did a small tatting. First I'd like to talk to you basically about what a quilt is. And a quilt versus a blanket. A blanket is typically one layer. A quilt is three layers or more. It typically has a top to the quilt, an inner layer of warmth and batting, and a backside. It doesn't become a quilt until all three layers are, are stitched together in a manner that makes it one unit. It can be made, the, the batting can be made from wool, cotton bowls, camel hair, feathers, and other blankets that are being recycled. The primary use of quilts is for bedding. A quilt can bring much more than physical comfort. Quilts hold love and memories, especially when made from recycled fabrics that already have a history. Quilts can also be made into warm clothing. Quilts are a way for a woman to show off her excellent needlework. In this presentation, you will see a few different types of quilts. Memory quilts, which are used to celebrate the life of a loved one and are often made from clothing or something significant to that loved one. Memory quilts are used to preserve treasured memories of people, events, accomplishments, or places. We'll see some signature quilts. They're a type of memory quilt. They date back to the mid-1800s and are a reminder of those significant to the recipient. People will sign the blocks and that will stay in a memory. Applique quilts, they have a design cut from one fabric, laid on another fabric, and stitched down. Sunbonnet Sue is also an example of a applique quilt. Then there is English paper piecing. English paper piecing is done by forming fabric around a paper shape and then those shapes are stitched together to form the quilt. Coverlets. Coverlets are not a quilt. Coverlets are not a blanket. A coverlet is more like a bedspread. It is a single layer that is used to cover the bed and make it look pretty. I'd also like to talk to you about quilt labels. Quilt labels are really important to do. What the quilt label does is it preserves the quilt's heritage. It's basically made from fabric and stitched on the back of the quilt. It contains information about the quilt. Think about what somebody 100 years from now would want to know about that quilt. Who made it? Where was it made? What is the pattern of the design? What was the significance of it? Why was it made? That's the kind of information you want to contain on a, on a quilt label in order to preserve the history of it. Now we're going to show you some quilts. This quilt here is an example of a feed set quilt. This is made by Evelyn Wilhelm Redfield. The name of this quilt is Feed Set Patches and it's from, made from original 1930s and 40s era 
feed sacks in memory of her grandmother, Marie Elizabeth Wilhelm, who made many family clothing items and quilts from feed sacks. Marie immigrated from the Volga colony of Pobachnia to Greeley, Colorado in 1908. She and her family, typical of Volga German immigrants of that era and time, were tenant beet farmers with few resources and amenities. During the 1900s, feed sacks were made of heavy canvas and were used to obtain flour, sugar, cornmeal, grain, salt, beans, rice, as well as animal feed, fertilizer, and agricultural seed. They were reusable with the farmer bringing back an empty sack stamped with the mill's mark or brand to be refilled. During the 1920s, due to the drop in the price of cotton, more companies began using single-use cotton sacking as packaging. These sacks became popular with Midwest farm women who generally had limited means. Many of our Volga German grandmothers used them to make everything from underwear and other clothing items to quilts and household items. Manufacturers noticed this and saw an opportunity for promoting the use of feed sacks and began producing them in solid colors. Around 1925, colorful prints, as represented in this quilt, began to appear. Women at that time used them for making dresses, aprons, shirts, children's and children's clothing. All scraps were cut into squares and triangles of all sizes and used to make quilts. Nothing was wasted. By the 1930s, manufacturers competed to produce the most attractive and desirable prints, including some border prints for pillowcases and curtains. In 1937, sack sizes were standardized. A 50-pound sack measured 24 by 30 inches, and a 100-pound sack measured 39 by 46 inches. These sacks provided a way for women to make clothing and bed coverings for their families, especially during the hard economic times of the Great Depression and during the war time of the 1940s. During World War II years, using feed sacks for sewing was considered patriotic and women of all income levels were making feed sack garments and household items. A 1942 estimate showed that 3 million women and children were wearing feed sack garments. One sack would make a child's dress or shirt and three identical sacks would make a woman's dress. It was common for women to trade their sacks to get the colors and prints they wanted. If a woman was petite, she could brag that she was a two-sack girl, an equivalent of mentioning today that you wear a size two. This is Sunbonnet Sue, also called the Dutch Doll. This quilt top was made by Elsie Kisley Mitchell before she passed away in 2007. The Dutch Doll is typically shown in profile, always with a bonnet on her head. The technique used to make this quilt top is called applique. Often the Volga German women would recycle old clothes to make the appliques. This quilt top is owned by Sharon White, and again, it is a quilt top, not a quilt because it is only one layer. It hasn't been made into a quilt yet. This is an example of Grandmother's Flower Garden. You will often see these flowers arranged in different patterns. This quilt is owned by Sharon White. It was made by Sharon's mother, Elsie Kissling Mitchell, who was the first generation in her family born in the United States of Volga German immigrants. It is estimated she made it prior to her marriage, which took place in 1943. The technique to make this quilt is called English paper piecing. It is a very labor-intensive process being made all by hand. Elsie gave this quilt to her daughter Sharon because green was her favorite color and it has the green border. Sharon's grandmother, Margaret Warner Kissling, made one of the same design but with a purple border and gave it to Sharon's sister. was made by Margaret Werner Kissling from Old Wool Clothes. This is a typical patchwork quilt. Margaret was born August 15, 1897 and came to the U.S. in 1907 from the village of Warrenburg. 
and she ended up in Fresno, California. Margaret made quilts her entire life, letting nothing go to waste. She made quilts for all family members, and they were all very well used. This quilt was most likely sewn on a treadle sewing machine and was tied versus quilted. You see the example of the ties in the corners here. Margaret was a very talented and prolific needle crafter, and you will see several other examples of her work in this presentation. This quilt is owned by Sharon White, granddaughter of Margaret Whirling Kisling. Warner Kisling. That's okay. Okay. The next several quilts are made by me, and I am definitely carrying on the tradition of my great-grandmother. This quilt is called Totally Tulips. It's a pattern by Missouri Star Quilt Company, and I made this quilt for my granddaughter Izzy. This quilt is a quilted bedspread. I made this quilt out of a custom design by me. I made it for my granddaughter, Allie, and this stays on her bed. This quilt is called Stones of Franklin, made by me. The quilt represents a Civil War era quilt. I use Civil War reproduction cotton prints in order to simulate the time period. The pattern is by Bonnie Blue Quilts. The Carton Plantation, located in Franklin, Tennessee, is the site of the largest privately owned military cemetery in the United States. One of the most significant battles of the Civil War, known as the Battle of Franklin, was fought there. After the Civil War, the resident, Carrie McGavick, looked over the fallen soldiers' graves until her death. The Stones of Franklin is a tribute to her life. This quilt is called The Duke. As you can imagine, it's John Wayne. This is a panel quilt. So the panel in the center is one solid piece. He's sitting on horseback looking over the sunset. Several of the smaller prints depict some of his movies. This would be an example of a themed quilt. This is a quilt top, yet needing to be quilted. The pattern is called Luxor by Robert Kaufman Fabrics. It's an Art Deco influenced quilt. Originally the pattern was designed for a fabric line called Valley of the Kings. However, I chose to use an Asian inspired print and surrounded it with batik fabrics. This is not a quilt. This is an example of a coverlet. It is one single layer. The back of it is all finished off so there's no raw edges. It is also an applique coverlet with the butterflies being laid down on a piece of fabric and then stitched around. This coverlet was made by one of my grandmothers, Aileen Moyers, and she gave this to me in 1974. This quilt is called Country Cats. It is an applique quilt. The pattern is by Debbie Mom. This is the very first quilt I made. And as you will see in some of my other examples, my skills have improved. <laughs> I made this quilt in the late 1980s and it actually won a first place ribbon in a county fair. <laughs> 
Here's another quilt top made by me. This pattern is called Dresden Bloom. It was designed by Aditya Sitar of Laundry Basket Quilts. She has a unique style of designing patterns. They quite often have piecing, applique, and other examples of needlework combined into her patterns. This one has three-dimensional diamonds set in here, has piecing, and then we have applique along the border. And she always likes to put a little bird in her patterns. That's kind of her signature thing. I hope to get this quilted later on this year, but this one is Dresden Bloom. This is a quilt that I made. It's called Gingerbread Village. It has a combination of techniques used in this quilt. It has piecing, applique, and hand embroidery. There are several areas where the hand embroidery is done. Then there's the piecing of the blocks and applique, with the, where pa applique where fabrics were laid down and stitched around. I did not quilt this quilt. It was custom quilted by one of my dear friends who's a master quilter, Caroline McCandless. And my favorite. This one is too. This is called Spool Quilt. Mm -hmm. It's made from batik fabrics. It's another design by Aditya Sitar of Laundry Basket Quilts. And again, we see a combination of applique, piecing, and the little bird. This quilt I made is called Carpenter Star. It was designed by Calico Carriage Quilts. Some versions of Carpenter Star has Y seams where you have to inset fabric. This one does not. It's all made from half square triangles. This is a crazy quilt made by me. The crazy quilt is one of the oldest traditional quilt patterns known, making its debut in the 1800s. It typically is a traditional pat patchwork quilt using a hodgepodge of fabrics all jumbled up. It gets its name from the crazed glaze scattered over the surface often found on pottery. This is another quilt I made. It's called a one block wonder. It typically uses one piece of fabric that is cut up and sewn back together to make different blocks. You'll see this block here looks different from this block here, which is different from this block here. The border is the original fabric that I used to create this one block wonder in the middle of the quilt. This quilt that I made is called Blooming Nine Patch. You start in the center with one fabric. It's made from all inch and a half squares into little nine patch blocks. And as you graduate to each row, you pick a color in the previous fabric to make the next row, and so on and so on. And that's how you get the bloom. This next quilt is also a grandmother's flower garden quilt with an ice cream cone border. This quilt was made by my great grandmother, Anna Maria Roth Sauerbrey, who immigrated to the United States with her husband, George Jacob Sauerbrey, and their children in 1912. The grandmother's flower garden was very popular in the 1930s and 40s. The family guesstimates that this quilt was made around 1935 and was a wedding gift to her daughter, Esther. Anna Maria passed away in 1943 after a long illness, so we know that the quilt wasn't made close to that time period. The center flower is always done in yellow, which you noticed on the other feed set quilts. This represents the center of a flower and sunshine. 
It's followed by a row of 6 hexagons, which is followed by a row of 12 hexagons. This is an example of a mosaic quilt. It is all done by hand, and these are inch and a half hexagons. The mosaic quilt, or the feed sack quilt, is one of the most labor-intensive quilts, and it was very popular in the 1930s. They can often contain thousands of pieces. I am in the process of replicating this quilt. Since I am not the owner of this one, I would like to have something that represents it. I am not using original 1930s prints, but I am using reproduction prints from the era. In a little while, I will give you a demonstration of how these quilts go together. Okay, this next quilt is an example of a friendship quilt. I did not make this quilt, but this quilt was presented to me by my friends of the Granberry Quilt Guild in Granberry, Texas. I owned a quilt shop there and often donated fabrics and other products so that quilts could be made for charity. So all my friends have signed this quilt and it was presented to me prior to moving away from Texas. This is an example of a label done on a quilt. I'd like to read it to you, give you some kind of an idea of what information labels should contain. So this says, presented to our friend Debbie Hearn in appreciation of your generous support of the Granberry Quilt Guild and its members. We wish you much luck and happiness as you pursue your new endeavors. Our love and affection will go with you in this quilt. It was designed by Monica Feimster. It was pieced by Monica, Beth Russell, and Donna Gadat. It was quilted by Darlena Burnett. It was bound, which is the outer edge, by Tricia Mosser, and the label was by Lou Bates. Godspeed, March 2010. This next quilt here is an example of a memory quilt. This quilt was made by my mother-in-law, Ruby Wilson, who was also a professional seamstress. She had six children. She made all their clothes, and this quilt is made from the scraps of the clothes. My sister-in-law was visiting at one time and she saw this quilt and she said, Oh my goodness, I remember Gloria had a shirt out of this and Daddy had a shirt out of that and I had a dress out of this. So this is a good example of a memory quilt. This is another example of a memory quilt. It is also known as a string quilt because it's made from different very widths of fabric, strips of fabric. It is sewn on a foundation piece and then the pieces are squared up and sewn together. The reason this is a memory quilt for me is because it is made from my late father's shirts. I haven't got it completed yet, but I plan to do that. This next item is an example of quilted clothing. I made this jacket in the 1980s. It has several different techniques on it. It's got a quilted patch on the back. It's got pleating across the back here. Fray points. There's two pieces of fabric bonded together and twisted here, and then quilting. This quilt won a first place category at a quilt show in the uh, quilted garment category. We'd like to show you some other examples of needlework made by Volga German women. We have several doilies here that were crocheted by Margaret Warner Kissling. These were popular items from, from the Victoria era through the 1950s. Doilies were basically round mats that were used to protect surfaces. They were used as clothing ornamentation, a head covering, and a way to show off a woman's skills. They could be found as a mainstay in every room of the house. These doilies currently belong to Margaret's granddaughter, Sharon White. These white-on-white -white pillowcases were made by Margaret Werner Kissling. We saw examples of her quilts earlier. The detail work is beautiful. She added a crocheted lace edging around the pillowcases. The hem stitch used along the edge was often seen in heirloom sewing. A winged needle is used to punch a hole, and then the machine stitches around the hole is finished off. These pillowcases are currently owned by Sharon White, the granddaughter of Margaret Werner Kissling. And here's another example of her pillowcase work. Absolutely beautiful. And then we have one here. Here she did cut work. You can see that. And then embroidered all around them. Absolutely gorgeous. This pillowcase was hand embroidered by Vogel German Marie Elizabeth Wilhelm. Marie was born on Christmas Eve of 1872 in Pobachnia, Russia, which was a German Lutheran village on the Burgess side of the Volga River. Marie, along with her husband and children, emigrated to the U.S. in 1907, settling in Greeley, Colorado. She also crocheted around the edges. 
and the openings of the pillowcase. She made them as a gift to her son Conrad for his wedding in 1956. Most women during this time period were proficient in needle arts. Embroidered pillowcases, dish towels, and other linens were popular for home use and as gifts for new brides or family. Many women also crocheted doilies and coverings for sofas and armchairs. These were most popular during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Many of our Volga German grandmothers did beautiful art, needle artwork. These pillowcases are owned by Evelyn Redfield, granddaughter of Marie Elizabeth Wilhelm. These tattings were made by Volga German descendant Vicki Strong. Tatting is a type of vintage lace work. It uses thread and tools to create intricate knot work that creates lace, often seen in doilies and edging trims. It's very possible that tatting was passed down from the knot work that sailors used to create their nets. This small tatting was done by Nancy Castro Gregory. She did about 50 of these tattings to give away as gifts to those that visited the Volga German booth at the 2019 Roots Tech in Salt Lake City. This baby layette was crocheted by Katie Werner, sister to Margaret Werner Kissling, both born in the Volga German village of Warrenburg. It was gifted to Sharon White when she was born. Very delicate, very delicate little crochets here. Such a sweet thing. I'd like to show you an example of how the feet set quilt goes together and how these hexagons are put together. We start with a center, a row of six, a row of twelve. These pieces of fabric are formed over a hexagon piece of paper. Back in the day, the ladies would fold this over and stitch the corners to make it secure. However, I find that hard to do, so I choose to use temporary fabric glue that is designed for this project. So it's held together. put them together like this and then stitch all hand stitching I'm just catching the edge of the fabric here trying not to pierce the paper tiny little stitches all the way across This is a good project uh, to have as a take along when it's still small because it's easy to put in a bag and um, take it with you in the car or if you're having to wait somewhere you can use that time to put this together and then once it's stitched together it's opened up and you continue on and you have to stitch between every piece. After those are all put together you end up with a flower. You can start removing the papers you do want to keep the papers on the outer edge so that you can secure it to the next row. But then you just reach in and pull them out. You don't have to put a hole in these papers, but I find it a whole lot easier to grab them. And since you're just stitching along the edge, you're only catching the fabric, not the papers. And see the stitching is still here. Once you've stitched this to the flower center, then you come back and stitch between the flowers and start your next row. And you continue on, you leave this outer row until it is sewn together into the other rows. This concludes our presentation. I hope you've been inspired to continue the needlework traditions of our ancestors.